Okay, hello everybody. Um, I think we're all here and it's working. Um, that's my hope and everyone can hear me okay. Um, I'm wondering whether my team can just like drop me a WhatsApp to tell me that that's <laughs> working okay. Um, welcome everybody to Beyond Dartmoor uh, and kind of an online event that we've organized um, as the Right to Rome team just to yeah, build on what's happened over the last month uh, with um, at Dartmoor, which has been extraordinary and exciting. And then we just wanted to take a moment to um, just gather ourselves and remember why we're here and why this is so important. And I guess what it means next for the Right to Rome campaign and how we'll win the Right to Rome um, by looking through the lens of like thinking about what happened at Dartmoor and the story there. So um, I'm going to um i'm gonna actually just jump straight in because we've not got heaps of time and we've got loads of questions to get through um and do keep putting your questions in the chat i'm gonna hand over um well we've got a few speakers tonight so first we've got um robert mcfarlane who is a writer and a long-term supporter of the right to rome um kind of movement and campaign and um right to rome itself as a thing um is going to talk to us and then followed by uh, lewis and annie from um who helped organize the dartmoor protest um are going to talk about what happened at dartmoor and what's next for dartmoor um and then i'll talk a little bit about right to rome um what we've got coming up next and um, in the wider campaign and the vision there and we'll move on to some of your questions um and bring you in um, to the conversation as much as possible. But yeah, thank you so much for everybody coming along. There's uh, like 436 people here. That's quite a lot. So um, yeah, so Rob, uh, please do do come in. Am I visible? You are, yeah, off you go. All right, um, hello everyone. Uh, hello all 437 and counting. Uh, if you're in the YouTube chat, please, say your name say where you're from be lovely to get a sense of the geography of people where where people are listening from um i'm rob rob mcfarlane i feel uh, really happy to be here the first thing i want to do is to is to wish you all happy in bulk um it's st bridget's day it's the day that sits in the midpoint between the the winter solstice and the spring equinox uh it's a, a, a pagan festival effectively that's marks the first day of spring according to to that calendar it marks the power of the land to to renew itself and of people to be renewed by that land and it's often been marked by visits to to places of of power in the landscape so it seems by coincidence the the perfect day to be thinking backwards at what's happened and forwards to what might um backwards first well it's in the recent past it's two and a half weeks only since the the High Court decision. It's 10 days since the immense protest on the moor, one of the biggest protests in um, in land history in England. It's six days since Labour pledged to reverse the Dartmoor decision, uh, bring a right to Rome Act when they come to power. It's six days since the Dartmoor National Park Authority voted unanimously to appeal the High Court decision. It's been an astonishing January in terms of the energizing of the politics of access in England and of course like all of us I want to start by thanking from the the bottom of our hearts really the person who has brought all this into being if you're listening Alexander Darwell thank you um when I first suggested to comrade Darwell nearly 20 years ago now that he serve as a a long-term sleeper double agent for the right to roam campaign I I just couldn't have guessed even in my wildest dreams what what would become of his courageous infiltration of the gun-toting class. Um, he's put so much into it, uh, lived as a hedge fund manager, um, brought this case against the grain of his soul, and then finally, brilliantly, achieved the decision that would galvanise the movement. So, comrade Alexander, we thank you. Uh, a joke, I'm also really angry. We are also coldly angry, angry at the use of power and money to extinguish a right before selling that right back to the taxpayer at a time where the Dartmoor National Park has seen a 40% real terms cut in the past decade, has had to find nearly £900,000 in savings by 2026, which will include redundancies. Um, 
angry at the commodification of the commons and the obvious fragility of the permissive access arrangement, which has now been, let us hope, temporarily put in place before a reversion to the status quo and beyond, angry at the need to tug the forelock by now vicariously having to ask permission before spending a night out on a diminished portion of the moor, and angry at the vilification of wild camping with reference to fly camping, the smudging of the two practices which are utterly category distinct into one another, and the endless recycling of photos of damage caused during the anomalous 2020 pandemic summer by fly camping. Um, anger is a fuel, um, but it has its costs too. Something enraging has happened, but something remarkable has happened, something hopeful has happened. And the question now, the question to us tonight, is where that energy is now directed and to what positive ends. Uh, and if we think about why the right to camp without seeking landowner permission on Dartmoor has struck such a chord, it's not because it represented the thin end of the wedge of the assault by power on access to land and nature, but because it was, we now see, the last relic of a long lost openness. Uh, to misquote that Joni Mitchell line, we didn't know what we hadn't got till it was gone. There's a term in evolutionary biology, back when I used to tweet words of the day, this was one of the saddest, um, and it's still always poignant to me for its pathos. The word is endling, and an endling is the, is the term in, for the last survivor of a species or a subspecies, whose death consequently means the extinction of that species or subspecies. Um, Benjamin, the, the last thylacine or Tasmanian tiger, Mary, the passenger pigeon, these were the endlings but Dartmoor cannot be and will not be an endling and it will be the point from which access reform in England surges outwards. Um, I want to talk briefly about sleeping outside because this was the crux of the matter um, and it seems really important to think aloud a little bit about why it matters so much and why the removal of that right is not just a sort of ornamental detachment from a broader access to, to the moor. Um, and I want to read you words that are much better than mine about this, Nan Shepherd's words. She was one of our most radical walkers. She quietly forged her own paths in the open country of the Cairngorms of northeast Scotland. She wrote The Living Mountain, a book that really, um, for me and for hundreds of thousands of other people, completely upended and, and reformed the way we think about mountains and about um, movement within country. She, in her book, the 10th chapter, the 10th slender chapter of those 12 slender chapters is called Sleep. And this is what she writes there. No one knows the mountain completely who has not slept on it. As one slips over into sleep, the mind grows limpid, the body melts, perception alone remains. These moments of perceptiveness before sleep are among the most rewarding of the day. One dwells in pure intimacy with the tangible world. Up on the plateau in midsummer, light lingers incredibly far into the night. Watching it, the mind grows incandescent and its glow burns down into deep and tranquil sleep. What is true of the high plateau of the Cairngorms is true of the high plateau of Dartmoor. Um, Nan is beautifully catching at what it means to be able to spend a night with the stars and the moon and the sunless sky as your commons, as your neighbours. And she's writing really of any place where deeper time and wilder nature might press more consequentially upon the spirit in the ways they do, where you might sense a bigness outside your human self, and where you might feel therefore part of and responsible to both a human and a more than human world to which you're relationally attached and many of you listening will know exactly what it means to do so and we have heard so many stories in the threads that have built on social media memories from 10 tour um, uh, participants from Duke of Edinburgh's award participants from everyday folk sharing the wonder of waking up and going to sleep of stepping out into a new day on the same open place that you went to sleep in it but this is what's been singled out as requiring regulation. And there's a key phrase in all this uh, that's been at the crux of the judgment, if you've read it, it's to do with open air recreation and what constitutes that. And um, this is a word which turns up a great deal in access law. Um, it's there in the 1949 Access to the Countryside 
Act, it talks about the opportunities the national parks afford for open air recreation, having regard both to their character and their position in relation to centres of population. There's a very clear recognition of, a, of an urban need there to to um, to to be um, at ease in the open air uh, in in the national parks. It's there in the Crow Act of 2007. Any person is entitled by virtue of this subsection to enter and remain remain on any access land for the purposes of open air recreation. And in the High Court ruling, um, Justice uh, on Dartmoor, Justice Floor was asked to rule specifically on what constituted the right of access for the purpose of open air recreation. And the distinction that gets made is between foot or horseback access and sleeping overnight. Um, I don't agree with that distinction. Uh, I think we need to hear the power of that word um, recreation and we need to actually hear it slightly differently as is often pointed out it carries within it a a, a deeper sense um, recreation open air recreation this is what wild camping can do it can return us to daily life and daily relationships bearing experiences that are beyond easy expression and that are impossible to forget and i deeply believe that it is part a substantive part of how generous and responsible and loving and inclusive and reciprocal relations get forged with land and its many inhabitants, human and more than human, who are our co-citizens. And the distinction between permission and not permission, the asking of permission, that's to say, is important. Um, if you have to ask permission, it incites a sense that someone else is looking over your shoulder and that someone else has the responsibility to take care of this place, even to clean up after you. I believe that when you don't ask for permission, it is not that your irresponsibility grows, but the opposite. The element of stewardship and cooperation rather than ownership grows. I want to end with a thought experiment. It, it could be a real experiment. Some of you will be close enough to have done it. Um, you can stand on the English-Scottish border, let's say Peel Fell. Um, it's just north of Kielder. It's part of the Cheviot range. And running across Peel Fell is a magic and invisible line. That line is the border between England and Scotland, and therefore it's the border between the restrictive access regulations that dominate England and the permissive ones that open Scotland to its people. Um, you can step across that line and there you can pitch a tent and you can wild camp without permission and do so responsibly and leave a positive trace. You step a yard back on the same moor, the same hill, the same fell and that right does not exist and Scotland's example is what must become England's reality. It must flow south as it flowed south from Scandinavia to Scotland in the Land Reform Act of 2003. I do recognise the dangers of confrontation, I recognise the dangers of opposition and a them and us discourse uh, emerging. Um, it, it, it's hazardous, it's often unfair, and I think the people who have brought this evening together and many of those who are involved in the community that is growing around the access question are absolutely committed to the dismantling of opposition wherever it is possible. So I end um, uh, with a full-hearted and genuine invitation to Alexander Darwell to spend a night um, while camping with me and others who would join to sit under the stars on Stallmoor or Peel Fell, um, wherever he likes, and to talk it all through. And I hope that we could then and there open the door, the vision generously to a future of free and fair and informed access to land in England. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, that was incredible. We were all just privately messaging, oh, we've got goosebumps. <laughs> I don't know you're like, hey. um, but that was really magic. Thank you so much um, for taking us through those thoughts and actually beautiful to end in that place of um, love and not a them and us. and um, Loves, I think, a really powerful, overused, maybe underused word, but it's it is the word, isn't it? It's about I think how we love all people, and if we're driven by that love, um, as opposed to maybe contempt, that might be a better place. I think. Um, but thank you so much, 
greatly appreciated. And you're you're hanging around for some questions later. So if you've got any questions for Rob, um, pop them in the chat. And I'm delighted now to invite, hopefully, um, a little bit more well rested than the other week, um, Lewis and Annie um, from the Stars of for Everyone campaign, and um, and the organisers. Um, one of like two of the many organizers of the protest but i know put in hours and hours and hours of effort behind the scenes to make that happen um who are going to talk to us a little bit more specifically about what happened at dartmoor what's happening at dartmoor and um to to, to bring that story to life for us so i'm going to hand over to um annie and lewis who are in the same building so that makes it easy we are indeed thanks nadia and thanks rob for that, that lovely um spirited introduction and yeah, this is this is really about stories, and and we'd like to share with you our story of of our view of this this campaign and how the last few weeks have unfolded, and the stories um, that we all have to tell as well about our experiences of of the Moors, and and also the invitation that Rob put out there on on Twitter and on Instagram for people to share their experiences and um, stories of their. Uh, time while camping on Dartmoor and it's one of the real the, the moments which that's really actually brought us together because people's stories are so powerful and um, and yeah we're, we're going to share our story of, of this campaign and, and hopefully for those of you out there who have weren't able to join us on the 21st of January that might help to to, um, to bring you along for part of that journey and so I, I think it's really important that we start off by saying that um, so Annie and I, part of the Stars Are For Everyone, a campaign group which um, kind of emerged out of this um, this challenge that was uh, facing us, this challenge of having the rights to wild camp removed uh, on Dartmoor. Um, but obviously, it's part of a of a much richer and longer history of um, of land access and campaigning, um, of which Right to Roam is is a really key part of that. And um, this this kind of small but mighty campaign group, which has has given so much to this over the past few years, um, it's been a real joy to to be part of that story and that journey as well. And so, also Dartmoor is part of a broader movement. It's part of a of a of a, of a bigger um, awakening around the issues of land access and land rights. And um, down here in Totnes, we we took part in one of the trespasses, which which happened last year on the Duke of Somerset's estate. And it was at that trespass where we met some of our kind of fellow campaigners who then were able to come together around this. Um, so we we went, uh, after we learned about the court case, we went camping up on Stall Moor um, next to actually on, on the Darwell's land um, to wild camp. And we, as we sat out under the stars on that um, beautiful evening, we recounted the tale of old Crocken, and um, and we sort of joyfully embraced this this old parable of this this ancient defender of Dartmoor. Um, as we sort of pondered this this kind of court case, which was looming, which nobody at that time was really really talking about. And it was soon after that that Rob put out the invitation on social media for people to share their stories, further raising the profile of the court case. And then fast forwarding to December, where Rallies were then planned on Dartmoor, um, as well as in London, to coincide with the court hearing itself. Um, I am a newcomer to land justice issues in the UK, but perhaps my experience is something that some of you who are listening today will kind of share, which is that this moment really galvanised me. It was this point when I read Rob's tweet actually and followed the map to the Guardian story and then saw and learned that this was literally the last fragment of land in the UK where this historic right was allowed to us issues in this country that it really mobilized me it really hit home and more than that it felt personal because I live on South Dartmoor and as I stand in my garden I realized as I followed the map that up over the high moorland, I could actually see the land that um, Alexander and Diana Darwell own. And he was my neighbor. They are my neighbors. 
And my son, meantime, he's seven years old. He's obsessed with nature and he is constantly lobbying for me to take him up onto Dartmoor and to go wild camping. And so it felt acutely personal that this was being stripped of our family, of my son, of future generations. So I followed that little tweet, that little link, and I saw that oh, there was an Eventbrite um, and there was a Gmail address. And I wrote to that Gmail address and said, hey, if you're up on the moor and out on manoeuvres, come and have a cup of tea if you need to warm up. Um, and I got a reply from somebody called Lewis. And uh, two extremely busy months later, here we are. Um, uh, December, well, I, I, in the middle of December, I found myself suddenly marching within this kind of cheery and defiant throng of 400 people, grannies, babies, outdoor educators, people who'd never been on a demonstration before, all stomping across the high mall. Meantime, Lewis and various others were speeding up to London to take the protest to the steps of the Royal Courts of Justice. Everyone working indefatigably, every possible media angle, completely unpaid, completely just through sheer passion for this issue. Um, the numbers, the coverage, the issue already got in December was extraordinary. And we'd clearly, you know, the strength of feeling was just immense. It had clearly struck a chord. What also struck me, looking back, is that we hardly had time to draw breath before Lewis and right to Rome, everybody else was on to the next thing. It hadn't ended, you know, I, the dust hadn't settled and we were planning the next action. And um, it was decided that we were gonna have something, it was gonna happen whatever the outcome of the court case. It was either gonna be a celebration or it was gonna be a defiant protest, depending on whichever way the judge ruled. Yeah, and um, and we planned to have 50 people on Dartmoor, and that was our plan. We thought, we'll have 50 people, we'll have a small gathering, perhaps a, a ritual, a summoning, a raising of old crock and of this old story, and we thought, well, we, you know, that sounds doable. Um, and so we concocted this plan in the pub before Christmas, um, as many great plans are, are developed, and we got in touch with a puppet maker called Ruth, um, who had actually been on the Princetown uh, march and, and thought, well, wouldn't it be great to have uh, a kind of totemic puppet at one of these demonstrations? And so after many evenings of exchanged voice notes with each other um, and Ruth saying something along the lines of these puppets make us bigger than ourselves and they hold up community, it just felt fantastical and bizarre, but also perfect to have um, the, this, this spirit with us um, up there as part of this protest. I should say that as we started to source the materials to build this, we still thought there would be only 50 people there, but maybe at a push there might be 60. And it was only later when the judgment came in January, um, just on January the 13th, the day before we were due to build Old Crocken, um, that it became clear to us that there was, a, there was such a massive um, a uh, sense of grief and loss and, and outcry at this, that um, this was going to be a, a, a big campaign. And so an event right was set up and we got to work with uh, building Old Crocken. Um, and that build was, you know, that was happening that weekend was incredibly fortuitous because it meant that, you know, along with those feelings of grief and rage, the very next day we had somewhere to take that energy and we were we already had the hall booked and we already had, you know, children and grandparents and creatives coming together, sharing soup. And we, we had a way to direct that energy. We had an outlet. And so organizing and having these kind of regular points in the calendar just seemed absolutely key. Um, uh, that was the first time I met Lewis in person just two weeks ago. There's a whole separate event, right, that could probably be done on the power of voice notes in activism. Um, uh, but that week, things just snowballed. The publicity went, went nuts. The permissive deal gave extra oxygen and publicity to the case and the strength of feeling that the decision to rescind the right to wild camp generated from people up and down the country was really breathtaking. And 
it meant something. Everybody's stories, everybody's support, everybody jumping on our socials and sharing their stories, it really meant something. And it also, you know, it reinvigorated the movement down here when we realized how passionate everyone was. Seeing that gave us extra energy. And it meant that everyone said yes, everyone from musicians to local residents of Cornwood to, you know, we could ask for anything and, and it came back, yes. It almost was too much. I remember we set up a Zoom call the week before it happened where we discussed whether or not to raise the event right threshold, whether to even cancel the event altogether because the logistics were so hard. And they, the logistics were, were um, pretty incredible. I mean, um, there were a lot of conversations with coach companies and uh, we if you don't know the the tiny village of Cornwood on the southern moors um, it's very remote and there's very few parking spaces it's just north of Ivy Bridge but at 10 o'clock on the, in the morning of the 21st um, already for 1 30 p.m when we were going to set off from Cornwood there was already 500 people ready to walk up to Cornwood and the other 3,000 people who were also waiting and on their way there um, were being shuttled up there by incredible uh, lines of minibuses which were, were taking them up to the village and meanwhile in the village hall there were musicians playing um, children were coloring in color in your own crocken um, courtesy of Nick Hayes and somebody brought along a make your a mini crocken activity which is also being done a volunteer has uh, brought some stuff to do that and so it, it felt amazing to, to kind of see all of that come together and, and to see the, 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 the people who were putting their time in. And people started to fill the streets uh, with their, their homemade placards. And then at 1.30, as we set off, um, this kind of extraordinary stream of joyful humanity setting off up onto the moors, um, everybody from babies and the very elderly, um, commoners, activists, um, people from nearby and far away were, were all on their way up to this quite remote part of Dartmoor. And Martin Shaw, who was our, our MC for the day, compared it to a vast cheery conga line on its way up as we kind of picked our way up through these narrow roads for an hour. Um, and once we were up on the high moor and the sun was, was dazzling down on us, um, I remember the moment watching the horizon and hearing this kind of cacophony of sound and and just emerging over the horizon came this, this giant figure of old Crocken. And uh, I remember seeing this through, a, I have to say, through a haze of, of tears at that point, this, this amazing view of um, children rushing up to the, this figure and um, dancing with ribbons and streamers and um, a, a sort of bewitching experience. And since then, lots of stories have been told of, of that day already and the support has been incredible. Some um, organisations and individuals coming forward, um, MPs um, pledging for greater right to roam, greater access, um, parliamentary qu questions, early day motions, as Rob has already said, and th that quite dramatic uh, decision by the National Park Authority to, to um, put themselves on the line and appeal the, this, this decision, which was um, amazing and seeing a public body kind of um, feel that public support for um, in that moment. Uh, yeah, I think that that is what was a particularly incredible moment last week. And so more will be said on that on that appeal later. Um, and I think kind of for today, it was completely historic. And I guess the question today is where we go next. But in order, as Rob said, to look forward, we're kind of trying to do a little bit of kind of looking back. It's it's very new to think about kind of what all came together. Um, I spoke to a lot of activists who were um, who led the road protest movements for an essay that I wrote last year, and I'm kind of really struck by the parallels of what they told me, which is the activists were there and they were chaining themselves to diggers and they were occupying trees but it was so much more than that it was a much wider coalition lots of it kind of invisible that all aligned in that moment to create those extraordinary flashpoints that you saw at 
Twyford Down and at Newbury, for instance. And I think probably some of the things that stand out to me beyond the visible cheery conga line, beyond Crocken, are Dartmoor itself, like the deep love and the sense of belonging that countless generations of people have for that specific landscape while camping and how totemic that is in terms of it, the nature connection that people derive from it. Accidents of geography, the fact that Totnes and Schumacher College with their kind of deep histories of radicalism and creativity are so close by. Um, the really strong sense of social justice that this movement kind of catalyzed. Um, the support of local and regional media and a few champions within national newspapers made all the difference. The support of the village of Cornwood who hung banners from their windows, they warmed up pasties in their ovens for us and they marched with us. And that really gave strength to our elbow. Um, the amazing heft of Right to Rome, who you know have such strong comms muscle, their brains, their policy relationships, who've been preparing for exactly a moment like this, you know, down to even being able to fundraise so that when it suddenly appeared that we were going to have to get 3,000 people up into a, this remote corner of Dartmoor, they were able to shell out for the buses and they stumped up for the village hall, you know, a whole host of people's incredible creativity, skills, availability, sharing their story, keeping this alive. And yeah, I'm not sure we'll ever know exactly what the Darwells wanted to achieve unless they do go out camping with Rob. But what we do, what, what he did, what they did was to finally wake up a whole generation to what we'd lost and really have provided this local flashpoint that has catapulted this issue of the erosion of our rights up into people's imaginations. Mm. And yeah, I'm, I mean, it's, it, it is, of course, a, a, you know, this flashpoint, this, it's clear to us that Dartmoor has become a, um, a big, big issue as part of a much bigger evolving picture around um, access. And the, this event is about how we, uh, tonight, this event is about how we win our right to roam, and so there's not no no pressure, right? You know, we've got to off the back of this, we've got to win a right to roam act, and we, and it's up to all of us listening today to to make that happen. And um, Nadia will say more about that, but we really need to now up the ante and keep that keep that um, momentum going. But we've seen through this campaign a wide range of people join together and and calling out this this kind of atrocious audacity which has been put before us in the form of this court case um rescinding our the last right we have to wild camp in this country it's this last vestige of land in england where we had this right um and it's it's shocked and sounded saddened people but it's not only wild campers that have come come forward uh, to be part of this cause and in fact on the day on that saturday i think one of my favorite um signs placards of the day was um I don't even like camping and I'm pissed off. And that, that for me kind of sums up the, I think the power and the essence of outrage and energy that has been, that has kind of been woven throughout this. Um, it's not really even about wild camping in, in many respects. It's about the decades, the, the centuries of enclosures, of clearances, of restrictions, which have been placed upon all of us. Um, and it's one of the moments that for many of us, we've realised what we've known, I think, deep down all along, that um, against many of our best efforts, our rights are being chipped away and um, are being stolen. And as we lose our rights of access, we, we're also losing our, our ability to connect with the world around us. And so, yeah, it's not any small feat that we have ahead and we have, still have a long journey to go, but it, it feels like a moment of opportunity and, and of possibility. Amazing. Thank you, Annie and Lewis. That was brilliant. Um, I never got to be there on the protest, so that helped me uh, live the stress of organising <laughs> through through what you explained, but it was really beautiful. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for everything that you did. Um, and what I'm struck with um, after listening to you talk, it's just Annie just said at that beginning then, like, I, I didn't like it was only two weeks ago you met Lewis or something and you only got involved really recently and um god that speaks um so much to 
the power of people and what I believe about people and what we as a campaign, um, as a Right to Roam campaign, believe about people um, is that that strength and power when you are connected to a place and a land and you have a sense of belonging, um, that people do the right thing, whatever the right thing is. I think intuitively we want to protect um, and we want to care. And, um, and, and, and Dartmoor showed it as well. Like, see, it was a really amazing example of what, what happens when we spend prolonged time in nature. What happens, um, I just wrote a note here when Rob was talking, I'm not sure whether it was his words or he was quoting something else where he said, to feel at ease in the open air. And I just felt like a really beautiful kind of feeling of freedom just in that sentence. And what happens when people have that sense of freedom and ease in the open air? And because Dartmoor was this anomaly where people could still wild camp um, there was, of course, so many different experiences and examples of people that had bonded really deeply to that landscape and felt it was part of them. Because ultimately, we are part of nature. It's inextricable. Humans have evolved alongside everything else. We've been here on this planet this same amount of time. We've left our fingerprint. We've we've loved it and cared for it in so many different ways. Um, and when we have a sense of belonging which is what has happened at Dartmoor that force to protect it and fight for it that we've seen over the last month is like an earthquake um because it 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 comes from something really deep within us um and i think um for me and for the campaign we believe that that's something everybody should have um which is interesting you know these conversations around the damage that people do people don't want to do damage there's not one person i've met who wants to do damage um to the countryside when they've spent time in it and they learn to love it and they build their own meaningful relationship in it whether it's camping whether it's walking or whether it's just hanging out and sitting in a field whatever activity you like to do um and so it's really interesting that the argument to change that would be to uh, further exclude in perpetuity, as opposed to think, well, actually, we need more education and a longer time and kindness and grace for those who haven't had the opportunity to learn and know what to do in it. Um, that wasn't what I was going to say, but that's just what came. I inevitably uh, miss out on my notes. I think I was going to just talk about the Right to Rome campaign. And what we've got coming up next um but just to to dip into that i suppose dartmoor has been a situation where we've um we've wanted to act because it's the right thing to do in a moment um and but i guess the right to roam has not been about fighting something or being reactive in the get-go the right to roam is about a vision um and a wondering, I suppose, about how might it be if we had the right to roam? How might it be if all people had the opportunity to camp? How might it be if the restorative elements of spending time in nature and spending time with your community were a part of all of us and they were all of our rights? How might it be if we could camp and swim and kayak and picnic and meet our community in nature? How might nature fare if we'd have all had a stronger bond to the land and also a responsibility to protect it? How might it be if we got to exist in that way and have not been, if the enclosures hadn't happened? Um, and I think the right to roam asks those questions. Um, and I think the vision is one of hope and it is one of possibility. Um, and I think the stories that have poured out of Dartmoor are an example of um, what might be and what could be if everybody had that access, um, which is really beautiful. Um, and I'm going to stop there just because of, oh, maybe I should talk about what's coming next. <laughs> um, and I guess big calls to action next from the Right to Rome campaign. Um, we, so we're not going to truly have the right to exist and wild camp um, unless we get 
new legislation to do that. So we do need new primary legislation legislation and um, to give us those rights to to roam and to wild camp and to do all of those amazing activities. And so we are calling um, on government to um, implement or bring in a right to roam act. And we have recently put a call out for people to to sign a letter to their MP. Um, and letting your MP know that their constituents care and that's what they want. So please do that. Um, and I think just uh, a big call out to keep going out in nature and um, keep camping, keep experiencing it. There is no point in any movement um, if we're not living the world that we want to see. So if we're not experiencing those moments where we've been easing the open air, we've seen the night sky um, with our loved ones and creating those memories, creating um, moments of happiness and joy and um, do that as much as possible as 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 important as any of the stuff as it is fundraising or writing to MPs um it's incredibly important for for our healing um okay so I'm absolutely delighted uh, that the wonderful Amy Jane Beer from uh, the Right to Run campaign also writer biologist incredible woman all around um is going to chair the Q&A for us and help me answer some questions um and uh, and just a big shout out to John and Maria in the background helping on the chat who are also going to try and channel questions to Amy to ask um so we're going to run up to the end with some of those so I guess everybody if you want to put your um cameras on and come back in I'm going to try and change it so we can see each other we can see each other but i don't know whether you can on youtube but hey ho um cool what we got first amy good evening everybody and um, thank you all for being here um yeah we have the chat has been busy we asked invited a few questions earlier in the day as well so we're going to mix and match between those that came in um early today and those that have come in this evening i'm going to start with one that should have a fairly fairly brief answer um and it's a request that we define wild camping. And I think this is quite important. Um, Rob alluded to the, the conflation of wild camping and, and fly camping. Um, Lewis, maybe as you're the you're the, the Dartmoor camping aficionado, could you give us a, a definition? That's not a title I've been given before, but I, <laughs> I do my best. I mean, I, I do think you know there would be a, a difference in how people would, might reply to this. But generally speaking, we're talking very much about uh, people carrying what they need on their backs, um, generally in the rucksack, and um, carrying lightweight gear uh, to stay uh, a night or maybe two nights. And we're talking about this in Dartmoor National Park, and so there are guidelines that the National Park issue around that. Um, you might take a stove, you wouldn't have a fire on Dartmoor. Um, there's there's massive issues with fire risk um, and damage d d done by fires. And so um, these are generally people that go out very, very lightweight, um, carrying maybe food you need for a couple of days and um, heading up into those kind of, uh, I guess, less easy to access areas. Um, and yeah, it's very different to, as Rob describes, this this kind of idea of fly camping, which, and the two things have been, it's very problematic how they've been conflated and uh, and we're constantly kind of rebutting this idea that we talk about fly camping, we talk about wild camping, and it's easy then to point towards issues of of littering and like rob said these kind of constant stream of photographs that get recycled and reused um, but the reality is that for most people who go out while camping you never know that they've been there i mean it's a leave no trace practice but we prefer to call, call it a positive trace practice and because the at the end of the day or rather in the morning when you pack up your tent the only the only impression that is left of a wild camp is perhaps a flattened piece of heather or grass and then that recovers and we move on but of course there's a massive impact and trace left on our experiences and our memories and attitudes and sense of belonging um, and so positive trace feels like a much better way of describing that people also take to the countryside while camping and often clean up litter and rubbish that they find along the way as well so um, there's plenty to celebrate about wild camping Thank yeah. you for that. Does anyone else want to come in on that? Just I was just going to point people to Dartmoor National Park Authority's website, which has a very specific definition of the exact bullet points of what is characterised, and they call the master principle exactly as Lewis says: leave no trace. Rob, did you want to chip in? Uh, I'm just going to add that the Scottish Outdoor Access Code 
handles this very clearly as well. Um, there'd be slight differences between that and the Dartmoor uh, National Park code. But again, yeah, small numbers of people um, not camping uh, close to buildings, roads or historic structures, responsibly removing all trace, uh, not staying for more than two or three days. Uh, I just wanted to very slightly tweak Lewis's idea that one has to go to the remote, the remote parts, as it were. And I think, you know, a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of families you know f f you, you you can you can find space under the stars um close to uh, a roadhead or a trailhead um and i heard a terrific interview with um the fee darby who might be in the in, in the audience uh this evening um on radio 5 she was talking about what's happened um since the sorry what's happened since the um, that's my 20 year old daughter trying to get hold of me, I'm afraid. Sorry. What's happened since the reduction of the of, of the available area for wild camping subject to the permissive revision? She said that she used to take um, uh, a, a, a woman who was in um, a wheelchair and there was a very good wild camping area that was close to a track. But that's now been placed off limits by the reduction of the area. So that accessibility is now no longer there for that person. So I just think that's a really good illustration of the fact that wild camping doesn't need to be far away. And its accessibility, which is everywhere in Scotland, is really key. Thank you, Rob. Um, so moving on to another question that's come in this evening. Um, are there any other groups that synchronise protests or marches in other national parks as a show of solidarity across England? Um, this questioner lives in Cumbria um, and says that access there is increasingly difficult and under threat. Um, and I think maybe we could use that question as well to talk a little bit about, you know, what's happening with the campaign elsewhere in the country. Yes. Nadia, how about? Well, yeah, shall I come in? Um, so I guess that just the first thing that comes to mind that I want to just answer in response to that is that um, there's been like an increased interest in having more like devolved right to roam action and groups across the country. So I think there's like 13 very budding, small kind of people going, I want to do something locally and which um, we're massively behind and supporting and trying to facilitate the kind of those embryonic groups at the moment um uh and some like you know quite well established ones that have been around for a little while but um we are really interested in like decentralizing what we do as much as possible um you know if you think about um like we just don't want to have one big homogenized uh, right to rule movement um the beauty in the localness of how people want to do things and what people know about their hedgerows and lanes and wildlife is the magic of having the right to roam and I think the heart of what we do. So um, there are, I would say, get in touch if you think you'd like to be part of one of those smaller groups so that people can um, explore locally their footpaths, footpaths that might have been lost that maybe need to be refound um, and learn a little bit about the landscape together around them. Um, and camp together, walk together and find their own community is really important. With regards to any existing groups that we, that are kind of like not affiliated with Right to Rome that are already doing this kind of thing, I'm not sure, I don't know whether Annie and Lewis in throughout the Dartmoor stuff, you've come across groups that are already doing actions. I think we're aware of people who are doing solidarity marches and certainly we've had interest from people up and down the country and Back to the original point about what the action um, the last weekend on Dartmoor, it was always intended to be either a celebration or a protest, but it was always going to be about extending that right to other national parks. That was so, so we were very aware that had the decision gone our way, this was going to be the way in which we rallied and tried to make a song and a dance about this right and how we extend it to other national parks. So, um, I think one thing that we've been looking at is the fact that there was a Glover review which recommended that every child in the UK have the right to sleep out under the stars and um, how we might be able to support that and encourage people to pursue that. Um, whether we have, I mean, people are reaching out. I'd say, I'd say look at our example um, and if you have that energy and that fire to do that within your local area then please you know reach out and reach out to us and reach out to other people within your community do you want to talk about the half turn yeah action yeah um <clears throat> so 
at the end of next month, well, this this month now, it's the 1st of February, isn't it? So the end of this month is, is the 20 year anniversary of the Land Reform Act in, in Scotland. So the ability that pe people now have to be able to go out and do the things that we're, we're campaigning for down here in England, um, including camping, wild camping. And uh, we'd like to, although it is February, of course, and, and wild camping might be outside of the scope of where a lot of people comfort zone might be but we're, we're encouraging people to use that opportunity during half term in England which is um, the week after next and then the following week leading up to the end of the month to go and camp in your nearest national park uh, and like Rob said that doesn't need to be kind of up in the in the sort of wilder less uh, easy to access areas we can kind of encourage people to to do that in um in perhaps a kind of places which are a bit easier to access in some of the the downlands or and the easier to access uplands and um, and perhaps do that with somebody who's wild camp before find somebody who's already done that and and pair up with someone and um, we'd like to offer something a lot more structured than that going forward at the moment it's about solidarity it's about building that kind of consensus that wild camping is uh, one way in which we can connect with the world around us um, and it's also about building up an evidence base that these experiences really matter and they resonate and they kind of echo through people's lives and and, and have importance and hold meaning um, but also building up evidence that that these pursuits are they are really beneficial in other terms and that the public are custodians in the countryside you know it's not something to be feared to be able to access and to be able to do those kind of things and um, so to kind of counter the narrative which is out there that somehow the public shouldn't be welcome and they shouldn't be able to do these things so yes Use that opportunity, celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Land Reform Act and um, camp in a national park and we'll get something more structured together further on in the year. And as well as camping, also write to your MP about what that experience means, how that's changed you and encourage them to back the calls for a right to own bill in Parliament because they work for us and they can legislate for this. So use your voice. Amen to that. Um, I think just on that, if um, anyone's interested in, in sending a letter um, with a little something extra, if you check out our socials or our website, um, then you'll find uh, a beautiful template letter with, a, with a, a lovely Nick Hayes illustration at the top, which we're encouraging people to embellish in their own way. If you want to add your own paintings, your own poetry, your own collections of feathers or um, I'll leave it to your imagination is what else you could add to that letter to maybe make it memorable to your MP. Um, and a letter landing on a doormat um, is quite an old fashioned cool thing. And we, we like that. Um, so moving on, this is a this is a, a question that um, more than one person has asked or questions on this line. And, it's, and it is important. Um, how are you making right to roam accessible to people who aren't rural, predominantly white and middle class? <clears throat> Nadia, could I ask yeah, you? I'll come in on that one because <laughs> I'm I'm not rural white or middle class. <laughs> um, no, I think it's a really good question. It's one that's come up lots, and it's one that I talk about an awful lot within the campaign and in, within our rooms. Um, and I I think there's two angles on that. Uh, I'm I'm trying to think about like is is the question I'll answer both. Is the question about how is the right to roam campaign engaging with um, those audiences or how does the right to roam as a concept as a thing happening and being given to us um benefit those who aren't rural white and middle class um and i think there's two different answers maybe on the latter um we are um so when we talk about the right to roam we mean something i think deeper than um just more access to more land this is um a wider issue of access and in terms of everybody should have the freedom to be able to go safely and at ease into a green space and feel a sense of belonging um which is a long story and a long journey that we have to go on to get to that place scotland for example has had the right to roam for 20 years yet there is a, there are a lot of people in glasgow in other ur urban areas who do not know that and do not access the countryside. So actually um, changing the legislation is one thing, 
but then how does the right to roam sit alongside other policy areas to ensure that actually longer term people we are feeling um more welcome in the countryside how does public transport take there for example um but i guess in the immediate i mean the, the our campaign's only been around for two years um and so the in the immediate um we've always said that Greenbelt is an incredibly important place to have access to. So how does Greenbelt and um, the areas around our kind of urban bits, um, how does that contribute to the places where people can roam free and walk? And it's a really important part of um, what we're calling on. Um, in terms of how do, um, you know, non-white rural middle class people engage with the campaign? Um, it's a difficult one, as with many campaigns, particularly when you're taking actions where you're trespassing. Um, a lot of the stuff that we've done so far around our campaign has been, in terms of the, like the action stuff, has been or the stuff that people have seen in the public has been trespassers, and um, and uh, they've really been a way of us being able to tell the story of land ownership and and um, and what we've and what our rights currently are um but behind the scenes of maybe the stuff that I'm not necessarily talking about are some bits of work that i've been working on um i we did we did an event up in newcastle and um, back end of last year um where i was working with people um very much not the demographic just mentioned um to talk about access to the night sky and seeing the night sky and worked with a bunch of people who had never seen the night sky and went out to an area that was safe um, making everybody feel safe and welcome to have that experience and actually specifically not asking the same audience so like we whenever we talk about trespassers we get like a lot of public interest understandably because it's fun and it's nice to meet have solidarity and meet people and um, but specifically we like put on that event to go like can we do this experience where we're connecting to nature together as a community not just about like it being a protest that we can probably talk about but actually is something to do with the community together which is what we did there and it was beautiful and it was on non kind of typical kind of right to wrong audience that's been out with us which was lovely um, and that's a template that and a way of working that I'll keep working and doing work in that area um, and there's other events and stuff that I'm doing that's being funded for um, to uh, work with um, black people and people of colour um, specifically around access to land um, there so lots of things happening um, but it's a huge question oh my gosh it's 1958 sorry <laughs> uh, i think it was like quarter two by the time i started talking um, yeah hopefully that answers it thanks nadia um i think shall we shall we continue on for another question or two would that be okay as as we're on a little bit of a roll um <clears throat> following on a little bit from uh, the uh, the call to action about writing to the MP. Um, we've had um, someone write in to say um, that they did that and they had a reply from their MP to say that he wouldn't support a change in legislation. He's concerned about unauthorised encampments um, and that he would not be prepared to support primary legislation that would create loopholes for a small number of people who break the law this way to exploit. Um, I think it would be great to talk about because a lot of us will get these these sorts of responses that will be negative or they'll be kind of standard cut and paste responses. Um, so how do we take it forward and how do we address someone whose immediate response is that people are a problem? Um, would one of you like to take that? I just spoke, so I'm happy for someone else to take it, but I can also take it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to say yeah. something that might, yeah, go, go, come might on, be helpful. Can, um, yeah, come in and, and then I can talk afterwards, but everyone's just okay. heard my voice sure. a bit. I mean, my, my knee-jerk reaction is, is, well, actually not everybody is going to be convinced that this is a good idea straight away. And we've seen in the last few weeks a huge groundswell of support amongst the public, but also uh, cross-party politicians sort of swinging behind this. And so rather than necessarily pointing to those individual circumstances, and uh, I, I'm sorry, that is the response that, that came back to you. Um, but, but some people will need more convincing. And part of the way we do that convincing is by acting and by, as Nadia said right at the beginning, kind of living that, living to be that example of, of what does that world look like if we, if we behave as if we're already free. 
Um, and so part of the kind of actions that Right to Roam organised and part of what I think um, the Saturday and Dartmoor was, was that kind of act of defiant celebration of, well, this is what is possible. This is the world we, we seek to gain through, through this. Um, and yes, slowly but surely, we've seen already organisations and individuals sort of going from, oh, look at those, that kind of radical fringe of people all the way through to kind of being able to kind of stand right alongside us on this. And so I just sort of say to people, if you're getting that kind of frustrating moment where you're, you're, you're being met with those kind of replies, and we just need to kind of keep building this movement and keep, keep going forward. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just to build on that, um, we cannot. Um, we well, this this idea that people are the problem. Um, you know, this this letter from the MP, by the way, is is not um, necessarily talking about the GRT community, but that's almost certainly what they're talking about. Um, and this is somebody who's making an assumption about people that they've never met in a scenario that's not happened and already angry about it. So it says a lot about who this MP is. Um, and I guess um, it's important to remember that, um, you know, the, the rights that we've had taken away over um, the centuries have really been because of, I guess, like it's always been traveling community that have been affected first or that they have been the focus of, I guess, um, probably most of the laws to take away rights. And then subsequently we've been affected by that way more down the line. So they have felt the force of this kind of exclusion for a lot longer um than we have and i guess um as a campaign at the heart of it we have to make sure that um we don't separate different groups out ever we we're not going to be free until we're all free um and i suppose that's just important for us to remember so um if we find ourselves maybe thinking and these are things that i've heard recently is like well we, you know it's okay if we have the right kind of people um, and if you find yourself thinking that there are right and wrong kind of people, that's your work then to do, like to reflect on as to, to who they might be and why you might have come to that decision. Um, I guess, um, yeah, I think that's that's probably, you know, that MP is a long way away probably from from feeling the way that we do as a campaign, which is, I don't think, I don't think personally, um, I might be going off script here and get into trouble, but we're never... For me, the right to roam will never be realised until, um, uh, like, the GRT community can have a sense of freedom and belonging. I think that will be the the sign that we have the right to roam. Um, uh, so yeah, that's my bit. Rob, Rob? Oh, just just very briefly, I just thank Nadia for saying what she said about what's effectively a dog whistle reply. Um, uh, but just also to to note that the, under the Scottish Code, I think it's always good to kind of look look north and see what they say. It's not a right. It's it's a right to roam. It's not a right to drive vehicles. Um, it, the mo motorised access is prohibited, except in the case of persons with disability. Under that aspect of the of the right to roam, you, if you are a person with disability, you can you can take a motorised wheelchair or, or a, an adapted um, boat uh, up water because we're talking about water as well as land. So um uh yes so the that that th these things um can be worked out and this person is i think as nadi brilliantly put it is um is making judgments about people he's never met acting in a situation that hasn't yet happened so yeah um we move on we do. We're going to move on to one last question um, because I, I know the answer is something that um, Nadia and, and, and perhaps I would, will, would love to talk about. Um, and that is what next? Sam asks, if we get a perfect right to roam as we see it, what happens next? Oh, my God, Amy, you go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so well, th this links into something that before before um, the Dartmoor um debacle happened and before we were all suddenly thinking about about raising um monsters and giants from the from the land itself to protest and turning this into the year of folklore um law spelt l-a-w um for, we're rather proud of that um before before we envisaged that um we 
our plan was that 2023 would be the year of, of wild service, which is our sort of our flagship ethos, I guess. Um, just the idea that in going onto the land, um, we're not just, it's not just a resource, it's not just recreation, it's far deeper than that. We are looking to, to make a bond and we're looking to, to give something back. It links into the positive trace that, that, that Lewis mentioned in connection to, to wild camping. Um, and that's something that lots of groups are doing already. Grassroots um, organizations and individuals are, are caring for, for their patch because they know that land, they are, they are giving service to it that they're, they're, they're picking litter they're doing wildlife monitoring they're doing um, citizen science of other kinds um, they're monitoring pollution they're testing water um, they're campaigning for their local river to, to have to be given legal rights they're campaigning for their local river to be designated um, bathing water status so that the water companies ha are obliged and the regulator the environment agency are obliged to to test and to check and to improve water quality and these are groups of people who are already exemplifying what 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 we know to be true that when you when you know land you come to care for it um, and it becomes your responsibility you take you take a kind of ownership that has nothing to do with deeds or money it's about belonging and it's about that place being your home um, so so this is wild service um, and we are going to be talking to lots of different people who have different ideas about how that service might be given. Um, it's a it's a delightful thing I and mean, we're not going to say you know we're not wanting to go out on the land to to enjoy it and to to benefit our our health and our well-being and our and our happiness um but we we absolutely see that this can work both ways we're living through um um a time of unprecedented um pressure on land on ecosystems the biodiversity crisis which is impacting almost more heavily here than anywhere else in the world um, and we are the most nature disconnected um, people in Europe um, and this is not disconnected from you know, these, these problems aren't disconnected our disconnection from nature means that we are losing our nature at a, at a, a terrifying rate while well, lots of people have no idea what's being lost there's connections aren't there um, and if we don't feel it and i'm not saying it's not painful to feel it if we don't feel it then we won't act um, so that's that is our mission for this year um, and um, you're going to be hearing lots about it i'm really excited about getting getting the ethos out there can't be beaten thank you amy that's amazing i think i'm gonna draw it to an end now and say thank Can you. Can I just to... ask one last question because we did oh, have no. one one last question. It's very, very short. Um, and it's from someone calling themselves Alexander Darwell. <laughs> <laughs> and Alexander Darwell from from what's, from Instagram today says, when are we going to get off his land and make our own campsites? <laughs> I uh, don't, I, I mean, I, Lewis, when are you going to get off his land? I'm up in Scotland. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, he he does have quite a lot of land, so <laughs> you know, there's a lot of land to get off, isn't there? So I, I'm, um, it's also a great place to go camping, um, but more, I, I guess, more to the point here is is uh, the the appeal itself, which is is kind of pending, and I think we haven't mentioned that very much, and uh, the fact that this court case is not over, we we've actually. Um, probably got quite a drawn out period of time now between now and sometime in the summer most likely when when the appeal will hit the courts and obviously that's a lot of time for people to forget what's going on um, and it's also a period of time in which the national park will have to kind of plan and 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 um, make preparations for that court case and um, there is an appeal which is going to be put together and the Dartmoor Preservation Association are going to be holding that appeal and they're going to be putting forward a crowdfunder for that which i believe will be going live on friday so i think there's 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 something here which we we all really need to do which is spread across our networks this this appeal which has national if not international resonation with, with people and, and i think the the need for the national park which is absolutely cash strapped and has been cut to the bone in terms of its budget over the, the last few years 
um, has actually stood up as a public body for the public interest with hope and with purpose. And part of that is because of, of the work of, of everybody that's come together around this. And so um, without making this too much about money, then the appeal is going to be costly. And so if we can if we can help with that in any way, um, it would be, be wonderful to do that. So look out for that on Friday and we'll be spreading that out across networks. And lots of people have already come forward wanting to contribute. But yeah, I mean, when are we going to get off Dole's land? I, I mean, I think that's that question is something that we should ask old Croc and himself who um, never really ever left the land and has always been there and always will be. Alexander, stop. Stop commodifying the commons is our response. <laughs> And thank you for making our point so beautifully on our behalf. I think we, we owe him that gratitude. Yes. Um, over to you, Nadia. To yeah, I think, I think we're done. I did actually want to just quickly ask before we close, was there anything that anybody wanted to say that hasn't been said? And I know, Lewis, it was to talk about the appeal and the fundraiser, which you've just done, so thank you. But anything else? Is there anything like words lingering in the air, Rob, that you're like, hang on, I've not said them or anything about the campaign that anybody feels like they want to before we close i, I just want to thank Car caroline lucas um who hasn't been mentioned this evening um late labor has stepped forward and said you know they would they would introduce a right to Matt, but caroline has been here from the very beginning before the beginning really and has been absolutely uh, relentless and unfailing in her support on this issue as so many so just want to say a big thanks to her yeah, I think we all second that. That's amazing. She's been absolutely badass. Um, so thank you, Caroline. Um, all right. Huge love to everybody here. Thank you for coming along and giving your time tonight. Thank you really especially to everybody who's uh, come online to, to listen to this. Um, uh, eternal gratitude um, for that. And I'm sure you're thinking and considering how you can take this into your life and world and potentially do things um if you're not already presumably you are um so thank you in advance and just love to everybody and have a lovely evening oh hang on i need to stop the live stream that's my job <laughs> <laughs>